in that ideological project, we have to consider things like how lived experience gels into a new mode of consciousness. God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see... We still, them. to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Hey, Daniel. Uh, welcome to the Diet Soap podcast. Um, right now, we have zero viewers, so what I'm going to do is tweet out a link to the Twitch stream, and maybe we'll get one or two. Um, but uh, And then I'll read your bio, but thank you. Thanks for coming on to uh, the, the the Twitch and to our YouTube channel. Um, and you are, uh, I'm tweeting this out, starting a Twitch stream with Daniel Tut from Zero Books. Is that accurate? or ah, that? <laughs> that's, that's, that's rich. That's good. No, that's that's very healing, Doug. I think that's good. I, <laughs> yeah. No, well, no, I'm, I'm not of Zero Books. Yeah, just for the record. Um, I'm, z- you know, whatever. I don't even actually know about the prehistory. Um, I watched your stuff and, uh, yeah. and uh, I liked it. And uh, at some point, I don't even remember how it happened. They said, hey, you can post stuff here. And I actually wasn't using YouTube. I'm not a video editor. Mm-hmm. But I had a um, theory podcast called Trissant's Vampires. It was kind of like Lacanian Marxism. Mm-hmm. It actually came out of a reading group we did of anti Oedipus here in where I live in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. um, with no ambitions. It's kind of an intergenerational thing. It's like me and a bunch of younger guys. Um, just you Are know, you uh, a millennial? Gen X? I'm an old millennial. Okay. Yeah. I'm, uh, you're, you're a Gen X, though. Yeah, I'm Gen X. I make that clear. Yeah. Almost every podcast. It's yeah. sad. It's pathetic how attached I've become to that label. I don't know what's happened to me or why, but. Uh, well, you're one of the good ones. I mean, in terms of your politics, you know, it's this kind of like rare, rare breed of Gen Xers who kind of maintain some fidelity to socialist politics. Yeah, I guess. I, I think um, most Gen Xers just sort of burned out uh, in general. I, I was on a. Um, a Facebook group that was called like, I don't know, G- Gen X rules or some crap like that this morning. And uh, just reading the sadness, just reading like, are there any dating apps for Gen Xers? That was the question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, hey, let me tell you. Anyhow, um, uh, let me read your bio. Um, All right, cool. Okay, so uh, Daniel Tutt is the author of uh, Psychoanalysis and the Politics of the Family, The Crisis of Initiation. He is the founder of Study Groups on Psychoanalysis and Politics, which is a public learning platform that offers study groups, seminars, and podcasts. And he's one of the podcasters who's replaced me on the old Zero Books channel. I'm glad to get a chance to talk to him today, and I'm sure we'll be able to get through this whole conversation without threatening litigation. Thank you, Daniel, <laughs> <laughs> for coming oh, on. Doug. No, no, that's good. It's a good way to start. No, I mean, look, I think, yeah, obviously what you did at Zero is extremely impressive and i i literally uh, here's how it happened actually here's how mm-hmm. it happened um i've been a you know whatever i've been teaching philosophy i used to be a really like left nietzschean and and covid happened early covid and um you know i started to um read los Cerdo's, uh recent translation the aristocratic rebel on nietzsche mm-hmm. and um was mesmerized. I had read his critiques of liberalism prior. And then I, um, through Lucerto got very deeply into Lukács, the, um, the old Marxist that, uh, Adorno hated. Um, right. that subsequently everybody has been forced to think that he's bad, but they don't know why. So in reading- Can I interrupt and just ask one quick question? Yeah. I was not aware, and this is, shows my ignorance really, that Adorno hated Lukács. Where, mm-hmm. where did he write about Lukács? the most hi i'm going to interrupt this video to let you know about the global center for advanced studies 
upcoming symposium in Belfast. Um, this is happening on May 23rd through May 27th. It's happening in Belfast. Uh, and you can find out about the seminar and symposium on the GCAS website. So uh, take a look at that. Um, there'll be a link to the symposium and to the GCAS website in the description of this video and in the uh, show notes for the podcast. Barry Taylor will be presenting the section entitled Radical Theology and the New Abnormal. And uh, Jameson Webster uh, will be presenting on psychoanalysis and the body. Uh, so take a look for that online at GCAS's website. That's GCAS, that's the Global Center for Advanced Studies, and uh, you'll find a link in the description. What what should I? Well, turn when to? when the, the big the big thing here actually goes back to Nietzsche because uh, Adorno uh, was a complicated left Nietzschean himself, mm -hmm. and Lukács wrote a book in 1954 called The Destruction of Reason, which put forward a thorough annihilating critique of Nietzsche, um, and if you read it. He really basically shows that Nietzscheanism was a class project, that it was a kind of Bonapartism effort to basically um, create kind of like what Pascal did, where he kind of created a kind of solidarity with a kind of petty bourgeois bohemian um, rebel spirit and mm -hmm. um, use that basically to um, maintain kind of bourgeois dominance in culture and added to which. So there's that kind of liberal dimension of Nietzscheanism, added to which there's also the fascistic dimension of Nietzscheanism. And Lukács was one of the first Marxists to really point that out and associate Nietzscheanism as a kind of ideological formation that helped um, justify the decadence of the what he called what Lenin called the imperialist age uh, or, or period. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Nietzscheanism became the kind of predominant um, justificatory ideology of the bourgeoisie in that pre-World War I period, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually why a lot of second international Marxists uh, were wrestling with Nietzscheanism. I mean, even in Lenin's imperial criticism against Machism, uh, the undercurrents there were also left Nietzscheanism. So left Nietzscheanism prior to the First World War was a live wire problem for socialists. Of course, it's Anglo uh, rebirth with Walter Kaufman um, did something completely different. And now Nietzscheanism became something for the celebration of a kind of hyperbolic individualism. Uh, it became, you know, even your great comrade, um, what is it, Rick Roderick? Rick this Roderick, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he he had some fond, fond affinities to Nietzsche. And everybody, in a way, had to have fond affinities to Nietzsche because Nietzsche helped paradoxically affirm one's own separation from the herd mentality, right? Mm. And this kind of... Um, paradoxical celebration of individualism and edginess and kind of hipsterism was sort of loosely associated with that. So anyways, mm -hmm. the reason I went on to zero for the first time was I was being interviewed um, on a, a really interesting podcast by this guy um, called No Easy Answers. And he interviewed me on Lacerdo's appraisal of Nietzscheanism, uh, mm -hmm. this incredible book called Aristocratic Rebel, which already is, um, no one has disputed it. No one has actually written a thorough rebuke of it. In fact, liberal Nietzscheans are forced to say basically he's right. Um, but what I like about it is that it's upending a lot of influences that Nietzsche has had on the Marxist left that I think have been quite deleterious. Mm -hmm. For example, let's we'll just take one, for example. Nietzscheanism is partially responsible, I think, for this common refrain that we hear on the left, that Marxists really shouldn't speak of something like the category of egalitarianism, right? Mm -hmm. There's no egalitarianism possible within capitalism, so therefore we cede that to the liberals. They can have that, right? But that to me doesn't seem right. Like, yes, liberalism does have a theory of egalitarianism, but it's wrong. And socialists actually need to start from that premise. I think the other big deleterious effect of Nietzscheanism is anti-humanism. I've been less and less convinced of anti-humanism these days. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a big thing because I was a huge Zizekian, you know. Let, um, let's talk about this a bit because um, yeah. um, on the egalitarian question, 
I don't. Uh, I I am skeptical of, of bourgeois egalitarianism, or or really, uh, that's not not even fair to the bourgeoisie. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'm they skeptical. do have a theory of egalitarianism, <laughs> right? I, I'm I'm skeptical of contemporary progressive egalitarianism, which turns into something altogether different. Um, it's often called wokeness, but that's that's yeah. the wrong way to to go about it. Thinking about I it agree. too, I think. Um, but uh, the reason why I'm skeptical is because of not because of Nietzsche, but because of the critique of the Gotha program mm. and the way in which Marx um, takes aim at uh, egalitarianism um, and uh, equality in that piece. And uh, without pulling it up and, and finding the citations, sure. it, it starts um, really as a critique of. Uh, the kind of equality that you'd find in the marketplace or the, mm -hmm. the kind of fairness uh, of distribution that you'd find there. Um, but it goes deeper than that. And the, you know, the, the whole adage from each according to their ability to each according to their need um, is if taken seriously and thought through and, 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 you know, cause it's obviously not enough. It's just a slogan. Yeah. Um, it, it, under, uh, under, minds the notion of egalitarianism i think we don't, I think we don't need like, equality no uh, in order to have freedom uh in according to marx so. I, I i agree with you i mean it's kind of like when engels talks about socialistic idea of welfare we get thinking about welfare in kind of fordist welfare mindset mm. we don't think about what welfare would look like after a revolution or transformation in the mode of production which is mm. what marxists mean by a theory of welfare and so I think it's an issue of um, clarifying our commitment to revolutionary praxis in a certain sense and to mm -hmm. class struggle. And so that's number one. Number two, I guess, Doug, I would just simply say that I've been concerned about the ease by which a lot of Marxists seed ground to liberal philosophy and mm -hmm. have done so historically. There's a whole history of that. I have an article coming out in Cosmonaut on second international Marxism and their relationship to American philosophy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture because I don't think that um, a strong exegetical uh, uh, attention to the mature Marx and value form theory can necessarily save us uh, from the danger that comes with conceptualizing class, class formation, class struggle, uh, revolutionary praxis or even ideology uh, through a liberal lens. So what Lucerto and other Lukács and others have really kind of alerted me to is maybe we could say a kind of uh, more a, di a different way of thinking about bourgeoisie, ideology, class. And that's kind of been a renaissance for me kind of personally. But that's sort of my first entry into zero. And I guess that interview kind of went well. And then from there, whatever, it was like, okay, you know, you can do your other shows here. And then mm -hmm. I, I did see that there was some drama behind the scenes with you for which the last thing I wanted was to be involved with that, because I think what Sublation is doing is quite nice, especially mm -hmm. as a veteran of the GCAS wars from a few years ago, you probably remember, I felt a lot of that was um, unfortunate because it was a lot of like petty you know, I have no memory of the GCAS wars, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know anything about it. It was just GCAS a lot wars. of personal, like rivalrous stuff going on. And like, mm -hmm. I really don't want the left in this country to, or, or globally, I know you're very internationalist as well. I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want anyone to um, fall sway to that kind of bullshit personally. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I am, am really glad GCAS is our only sponsor at the moment and they are hosting seminars and and you know creating uh educational uh content um yeah. and pro and real actually accredited um programs right uh um with with instructors who i like i mean todd yeah. mcgowan is our first author and he's done a seminar recently with gcas and i it's just very feel like exciting. It's i used to, i used to that. teach for them too and uh was deeply involved and i really i like what creston is doing i think mm -hmm. it's important so I feel glad. bad for Creston these days because he had a, a dalliance with crypto and uh, I worry that maybe they won't be able to continue to support. I'm kidding. I don't think that's going to be a problem, but boy, the crypto thing sure seems to have blown up, but let, let's stay on Nietzsche for a moment. And yeah, because I, I, yeah. the, the, the question about what zero books, uh, you know, did and the 
back and forth on that is interesting to me. Yeah. But it really shouldn't be that interesting to no. To I, 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 yeah, listeners I, I, and readers. For yeah. sure. For sure. Um, so, um, but Chris, Chris, but Chris, but Chris did throw me under the bus by uh, Cutrone said, you know. Oh yeah, we'll get to that. We'll, we'll get, get to that. that. We'll get to that. Okay. We'll get to yeah, we'll get to Chris Catrone. Yeah. Uh, God knows we have to get to Chris Catrone. But um, before we do, I just want to go back to this question of Nietzsche mm-hmm. um, and the bourgeois uh, and in the way that 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 was a kind of bourgeois ideology. Yeah. Uh, the, the Nietzschean project was yeah. bourgeois, and it was about shoring up the uh, bourgeois power. Um, but you know, at the time that Nietzsche arose mm-hmm. uh, i mean remind me exactly when he was was born uh when was nietzsche born um yeah so he's born you know before 1848 right he's a young man he's not really um affected by it the event that really catalyzes nietzsche is the franco-prussian war of 1871 for mm-hmm. which he was uh, willingly left his teaching post to participate in that a conflict, which is interesting mm-hmm. because that conflict was against communists mm-hmm. <laughs> who were being executed in the streets of Paris. Um, and, and Nietzsche saw that. He said uh, there was a rumor that went around. It was against communists. What 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 year was this? Again? Paris Commune of 1871. Oh, 1871. Paris Commune. Of course it was against. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so there's a rumor that the communards had burned down the Louvre, the great, you know, Mm-hmm. museum and um nietzsche said never upon hearing this rumor never have i had a more sad saddening experience to learn of this and um uh so so the, the argument i'm trying to make is that um you could you could call his first major work uh genealogy of morals that kind of early nietzschean project um as l- much of its impetus being a an explicit anti-communist anti-socialist uh position uh but things for nietzsche became um quite complex because he's in bismarck's germany and bismarck's germany was uh, from a marxist standpoint a bonapartist regime Mm -hmm. they had the anti-socialist laws on and off for -hmm. which sometimes nietzsche supported them sometimes he didn't uh, Nietzsche was at times very much in support of the National Liberal Project. At other times, he backed away. So his politics were in a kind of dialectical tension with the movement of events at the time. But overall, the mm, consistent commitment of Nietzscheanism was broadly liberal Bonapartist in the sense that what he really wanted was the creation of of a new type of caste, which importantly uh, would not reify the vulgar Wagnerian type of racial animus or racial Mm -hmm. exclusionary logics. Nietzsche actually thought that um, we need to kind of do what Napoleon did in his uh, unification of Europe through this kind of liberal meritocracy, but on Mm -hmm. a higher level, um, such that we it, concoct a kind of Manichaean division within civilization all around the overarching goal for creating the conditions for art making and culture making to flourish, right? So his, and even if you read Leo Strauss, the you know great neoconservative philosopher, he even accuses the Marxist left of being disingenuous when they neglect this agenda of Nietzscheanism, which is hardwired into Nietzscheanism. says so it's almost foolish that these leftists get um, seduced by Nietzsche and they forget that this is the kind of core of the project. And when I say it's the core of the project, a lot of Marxists will come to me and say, well, you're confusing his opinions uh, with his concepts. And there's, so there's this existentialist Nietzsche that we can kind of turn to, will to power, eternal return of the same, death of God, etc right that mm-hmm. kind of like um Camus Nietzsche right and we can separate that from the political Nietzsche I mean if you look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy um they actually treat Nietzsche in that entry uh as a completely apolitical thinker right mm-hmm. so 
It's just very interesting to me that we have a long history of Marxists in the second international period and later, Korsh, Lukács, etc. And Adorno is in part responsible for extinguishing this memory. Those thinkers pinpointed Nietzsche and Nietzscheanism as a deleterious effect on philosophy. And it's deleterious precisely because it justifies I mean, what the other big thing, Doug, and I know I know I'm going on a tangent here. Mm. The other big thing that, that worries me mm. that people miss in Nietzsche is that Nietzsche created a kind of secular theodicy, mm -hmm. which means that Nietzsche centered human suffering in such a radical way that he was seeking to argue that the Greeks had discovered something about aesthetics, about higher culture which necessitated caste divisions in humanity, right? Mm. And that what that meant was that those rare souls who are exempt from wage labor hmm, mm. are eligible to suffer at a higher level than workers. Mm. And so what Nietzscheanism actually does, and this is, goes back to class struggle and thinking class, is Nietzsche invites us to do something which nobody wants to do on today's left, which is actually to talk about the suffering of workers. What is the meaning of suffering? Now, now there are a few philosophers. I mean, Pierre Bourdieu does a lot of stuff on neoliberalism and working class suffering, which is really interesting because so many academics, like he makes their skin crawl. But I think that's a healthy conversation for us to have, is the kind of, because what Nietzscheanism is about, what resentment is about is concocting a society in which the suffering of workers is not eligible for the production of great culture of great art and it's paradoxically a society in which everybody's in their in their place and only a few are exempt from wage labor have the leisure time i mean why why when nietzsche fought in the franco-prussian war the motto of the prussian army was otium et bellum struggle and toil for the preservation of leisure time for the aristocratic few. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's, that's, the, that's, that, that, that's, so that's, that's a monstrous, that's a monstrous. Uh, sure. Absolutely. Here's the thing though, um, uh, that, that I wanted to kind of circle please. around and critique uh, a little bit or, or try to come up to grips with. Um, it, it seems to me that, and I've only read the genealogy of morals in a few excerpts. I'm not a Nietzsche scholar by any means, but um, it seemed to me that uh, there's a romantic streak to Nietzsche. There's a desire to return to some sort of uh, authenticity, authenticity that wouldn't be based on uh, re religion. You know, it would be secular kind of. Um, but, yeah, and it, there's an existentialism you mentioned mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm, to Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. But um, it, uh, I, I'm just. I, I also were reminded of uh, what Rick Roderick said when, um, when in defense of Nietzsche from from uh, right wing critics, critics, mm -hmm. uh, conservatives who would say, you know, he undermined, uh, you know, ethics and uh, moral values, and 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 uh, uh, Rick Roderick would say, you know, to blame some poor philosopher. Mm. for what is really the a, you know a process of the totality or you know really just mm. the way history has come out he, he Nietzsche is a product of you know an expression of the times rather than a cause of 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 uh what's happened that's what Roderick would say so what I would say is like okay you mentioned him as a defender of liberal bourgeois power paradoxically which, right yeah right right paradoxically and I think that's probably true Right. Certainly, when you listen, when I hear you describe him justifying a caste division, right? But a caste um, division, a caste uh, between division between the workers which, and the rest, right? And the and the upper classes or the ruling class, a, ca a caste division which doesn't need to align itself with a particular party for its efficacy. That's the that's the that's what I mean by paradox. So, and, like this so early meritocracy, it's sort of. Exactly. It's a kind of it's a kind of um, ideology which, uh, well, the early meritocracy would be the first round of Bonapartism. Nietzscheanism of like Napoleon's 
um, uniform, uniform is uniformizing of um, and codifying, you know, the school system uh, based on meritocratic and liberal principles across Europe and so on, which was a long process, which was unevenly distributed and so on. Um, Germany never fully went through that uh, revolution, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in a way, Nietzscheanism is, is a um, hyperbolic form of meritocracy such, but, but one in which um, becomes a self-justifying principle of ruling elites. And you could say also in a certain sense, even though Nietzsche has a strong criticism of academics, of the university, as we know, um, mm -hmm. which actually started much more with Schopenhauer because Schopenhauer was a thinker who um, insisted upon a separation of the philosopher from the university system, which is an interesting point. Um, even though that's uh, at play, I follow Lukács' line, which is that Nietzscheanism emerges after the disillusion of Hegelianism in the late 19th century as a kind of organizing um, ideological project uh, in the wake of the crisis of bourgeois philosophy, right? So Nietzsche becomes aware that the coherence of bourgeois philosophy was kind of losing its losing its edge, okay. lo losing its luster. And that that is what Lukács calls a decadence. So mm -hmm. in other words, European society in the imperialist period was undergoing decadence. And which means that all of its values, all of its kind of um, class project could not legitimately convince or maintain the efficacy of its rule. So Nietzscheanism becomes a way to kind of um, accelerate beyond all of those contradictions of the bourgeois class project, mm -hmm. wh while at the same time maintaining the kind of implicit caste hierarchy of it, right? Sure. Uh, let me, yeah. okay. So let me, so um, this, everything you said just sort of uh, makes me feel more secure in my point, which is that um, the Hegelian, like Hegelian philosophy, like one of my thoughts about Nietzsche is just that he's a one sided Hegelian. This is a, 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 a critic of modernity, a critic of bourgeois culture mm -hmm. that doesn't think dialectically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, okay. So, uh, so there, that would be, so like, if you want to understand the death of God, you can read Nietzsche, but it's better to read Hegel. Um, it's sort of how I, I think of it. Um, yeah. And, and, and that doesn't say very much, but it's sort of a shorthand, uh, mm -hmm. but, but to, to get to the point, like the kind of equality that developed under bourgeois culture and the reason that, uh, the inequality and uh, and the class divisions were a crisis for bourgeois cultures because mm -hmm. of the, the bourgeois principle of equality, you know, as as a foundation. It came out of wage labor, like uh, breaking up of the old aristocracy, breaking up of the old forms of production, the development of free labor that can be mo that was mo relatively mobile, mobile that was legally protected. That you know you had you had rights, you had formal legal rights. You were an individual. You you could negotiate a contract. That's that's the kind of equality that the being working class rather than like a feudal peasant gave, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that couldn't be undone. That kind of freedom couldn't be undone by some Nietzschean ideology. You know, there are ways in which it gets undone. That it becomes you know stripped away. And obviously, the fact that um, that the that the, the, the basis of that uh, freedom to sell one's labor mm -hmm. is the the fact that you don't have property that you you're alienated from the products of your labor that's that's not nietzsche's fault but that's the, the limits of bourgeois society that's that's the primary class division is that right is that it relies upon a materially impoverished class despite the formal freedoms that it that relies upon so that would be well, That's what, just the what, what, of what, I think, what I want to say that makes sense, though, and I have a point taken. What I would respond to is is the following, which is Nietzsche created sought to create a comprehensive philosophy, which sought to put working class, the creation of working class worldview, in its in its place, to relegate it as an appendage to cultural production as such, and to maintain 
a commitment to the advancement of high art, of high mm -hmm. conceptual European artistic production, etc., to maintain that uh, as the purview of a very select few. Uh, so that concerns me. It concerns me in part because when Nietzscheanism in the 20th century, say if we look at the spirit of 68, mm -hmm. why is it, Doug, that so many of the 68 philosophers completely abandoned, and of course Nietzsche was their mascot, okay? Mm -hmm. from, from, I'm talking here of the French Nietzscheans in particular, right? Um, Blanchot, uh, Bataille, uh, Derrida, Gilles Deleuze, Mm. Uh, Sartre less so, in interestingly. He hated Nietzscheanism, actually, to his credit. Um, mm. But why did they extinguish, by and large, any mention of working class organization, working class consciousness, etc.? Now, you could say, well, late capitalism, the early onset. You mean post-68, after 68. After 68, after yeah. 68, yeah, after, mm. exactly, exactly. Exactly. Mm. Well, why, why, if Nietzsche becomes the kind of muse of 68, and if we accept, you know, the thesis I'm sure you're familiar with of the new spirit of capitalism, that the kind of spirit of 68 in its revolt, aesthetic, etc., infused managerial culture and flexible, fluid neoliberal capitalism. Jeff Waite, a great American philosopher at Cornell, who's been on my program, and he wrote a book called Nietzsche's Corpse, and he's one of the um, first people in the 90s to really bring back a Marxist critique of Nietzsche. He really, I think, points out quite nicely that we should understand aspects of early of 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 the left wing of neoliberalism as a Nietzschean project in a certain way, mm -hmm. and that concerns me. I think also because if Nietzscheanism basically reaffirms middle class sensibilities, and it, it, that's actually its function in a certain sense. In in fact, Nietzscheanism. Uh, disables the class question, if you like, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. some sense. Um, that concerns me. Uh, uh, this, I think, also means that we should speak about critique of ideology as well, because I think mm -hmm. that... Um, well, I want to answer your question as to why yeah. those philosophers abandoned Marxism. Let's you say. want to answer that? I would, yeah, please. Yeah. What do you, what, I mean, what, I think it you... has as much to do with actual real political failures more to do with the political failures of stalinism the 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 i mean you could you could trace it back to 1919 in germany the failure of the german revolution but you could yeah. certainly trace it back to um to uh the the way that stalinism and the soviet project came undone by night by 1956 in hungary the hungarian revolution kind of uh undermined the power of communists in, on the left. Uh, and, you know, 1968 was a paradoxical uh, workers' revolt. It was not just a workers' re revolution. It was not organized. It was against the Communist Party right. in Paris, say. Um, and uh, it, it, it was a product of the new left, which was trying to take up a multiple mm -hmm. uh, projects of, of resistance and right. um, multiple movements rather than a proletarian politics. Right. Um, and then when that failed, um, there was a retreat and there was a, and there was a victory for, you know, the conservative forces. I wouldn't say reactionary. I would say the conservative forces and, and uh in bourgeois culture and capitalist under capitalist culture and yeah so turning to nietzsche was uh ideologically convenient like we, what, what comes like let me give you one other example like uh, at the beginning of black lives matter yeah. after george floyd was killed there was a brief moment of an a, 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 of interest uh in uh anarchism of different types um there was a, uh, and there was particularly kind of left, uh, left Marxists that were kind of rising up um, and getting clicks, <laughs> you know, old lectures from these left Marxist value theorists. Of course, I would be aware of them because that's where my interest is. But I think that they, uh, there was a theory of the mass as a revolutionary force that came forward right around the, the, the protests of George Floyd. And those ideas mm -hmm. 
um, despite their limitations, which were like self-admitted mm. by these series, like I don't know how any of this leads to revolution. I don't know how any of this becomes actually political mm -hmm. would be what they would say. But nonetheless, those series gained uh, uh, dominance for a while um, because it, it would allowed people to act without st struggling deeply with the with the need for politics in that moment and yeah. and to and and like you know the the in seattle the temporary autonomous zone and mm -hmm. like my own kids would talk to me about how they're reading the anarchist cookbook mm -hmm. as they started uh, to to organize uh, after george floyd i don't think you can say oh the problem is this anarchism and if those books didn't exist then the, they would have overcome uh the the their impasse and the protest around George Floyd would have been political, mm -hmm. but rather there hadn't been a building. They hadn't built up institutions. Mm -hmm. There hadn't been a built up build up of either a party or some sort of organi organization that could organize mm -hmm. the, the, the dissent politically. And that's why uh, the George Floyd protests fizzled out in, mm -hmm. in the United States turned into the Biden campaign. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, I, I look, I'm not making an idealist claim that Nietzscheanism as a kind of set of ideas is the causality for the collapse of um, class consciousness. Right. Although, although, ask yourself this, mm -hmm. why has class consciousness become such a dirty and taboo word amongst intellectual Marxists? Ask yourself that. And Nietzscheanism has something to do with that, right? He has a lot mm -hmm. to do with that. The other mm -hmm. thing I'll say, and this has come out in my study of second international Marxists, is that, you know, they made a break with Engels in early, like you said, you know, early, early 20th century, 1880s up through about 1920, mm -hmm. before 1917, where the category of personal experience, and Nietzsche has a lot to do with this, mm -hmm. became theorized by Marxists as a site that's eligible to revolutionize without a revolution in the mode of production. And that thesis was adopted by the new left and became the animating principle moving forward. And so gradually the left, especially even Marxists, abandoned that Engelsian um, emphasis on the necessity for a transformation in the mode of production and started, and this is where psychoanalysis becomes in too, because psychoanalysis becomes kind of a bad guy in this in this light in my in my view mm. because it gives further credence to this presupposition because nietzscheanism at the end of the day is a deeply individualist liberation theory hmm? which mm. has the trap if you read read bataille has the mm. trappings of this profound esoteric um i mean by the end of bataille's project he becomes a christian again because he goes yeah. so deep into nietzsche um Oh. But there's there's nothing about class consciousness. There's nothing about building a worldview of the working class. And, and we should we should like define what do you mean by class consciousness? I think we're on the same page here. You're you're winning me over as we go along. But but what do you mean by class consciousness? Well, uh, okay. What I mean by class consciousness would be the emphasis not on looking at class as a descriptive mode of contradiction of capitalist life, which I think we have a tendency to do when we think about ideology in general, like commodity fetishism has a kind of um, function of fetishist disavowal that affects all subjects, irrespective of their class position alike. Mm -hmm. What I'm interested in is a possible revisitation of a theory of ideology from below, which would be more returning to Engel Engels, where Engels spoke of ideological power, uh, which would be about theorizing some messy categories that a lot of Marxists don't want to theorize. And by messy, I mean the category even of lived experience. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll just throw this out there for the benefit of your listeners. Jan Raymond, uh, who's a very interesting Marxist cri uh, critic of Nietzsche, but also has written an interesting critique of Lacan and mm -hmm. of Zizek in his book on ideology. He says some interesting things. He says, you know, look, we kind of, with Althusser, went wrong on the Marxist left in conceiving of ideology as decoupled from a class project. 
And so mm-hmm. things like, okay, well, we have a theory of the working class. We have we have to, as Marxists, develop, which itself is an ideological endeavor to theorize mm-hmm. classes, an ideological project. Mm-hmm. In that ideological project, we have to consider things like how lived experience gels into a new mode of consciousness. And he uses an interesting example from after apartheid, Jan Raymond does, mm. um, called We Are the Poors. It's an interesting movement of uh, South African blacks mm. who, after apartheid, they did not have the formal economic freedoms that apartheid was supposed to grant them. And Raymond shows that they had to shrug off the uh, bourgeois, both black and white bourgeois, ideology imposed upon them in order to affirm their class status. That's what he means by ideological power from below. And the only way that they could do that was by forming a proletarian cultural counterpublic that would allow that, that allow that lived experience to develop its own ideological direction. That would be what I mean by class consciousness. Okay. Okay. What was that ideological direction? Like what, what, what kind of politics? It was, it was formed around a new signifier, if you like, of affirming their status as poors. We are the poors was the slogan. So it's around the creation. And, of, and where were their demands aimed? Uh, and what kind of actions did they do? Yeah, I, I don't actually, I'm not as familiar with the whole, like, um, case, I can't give you like a full breakdown of the case study in depth. But what I right. can say is point you to Raymond's work, because his is a theoretical work. It's not an empirical study, mm-hmm. um, although it invites a lot of empirical studies to take place. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something maybe a future episode we could we could examine. Because I, think- I just want to say like what yeah. my conception of class, like I read Lukács' History and Class Consciousness, Please. and I, you know, I found it uh, tr- uh, kind of difficult as i you know worked along to to try to pull out precise meanings uh, you know I, it was written at a particular time in a context that i no longer am in i, I had to go through yeah, it yeah, and, yeah. No, and, I'm, I'm, yeah yeah one of the things i tried to determine is just what was meant by class consciousness and like the divi- the difference between being a, a class for itself and in itself was mm-hmm, mm-hmm, important mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. i can't i can't recall uh which is which here but i believe that for for Lukash, the class consciousness is the determination uh, that there's a need to transcend the class relation itself. Right, right. Um, and you know, right. you can look into that as um, uh, you know on various levels. I tended to think about because you would talk about self interest and and class interests and uh, uh, you know the question of whether or not a class consciousness could develop through uh, unionization might not be in that right. Uh, right. particular book, but, but it was, it was a question for Lenin a question for the socialists and right. th- that distinction between being self-interested as a worker mm-hmm. and being part of a class project to overcome class relations. Right. Is to me a key distinction. That, I, that's, you're that, right. that's class. It, it is. No, no, it is. It is. And, and Jan Raymond's book, offers a critique of both Lenin and Lukács in an interesting way, where he says, actually, that mm, dialectic in itself, for itself, that movement could only be afforded by what Lukács called imputed consciousness, which was the position of the intellectual. Position of the intellectual was the bridge to push the uh, unrefined development of people trade union consciousness right like there in other words uh raymond wants to say that Engels had a better theory and even he says gramsci too which actually sought to empower and you could think of gramsci's organic intellectual here mm. uh a form of class consciousness which didn't rely upon imputed consciousness and that lukacs's whole theory of ideology falls apart because it has that kind of elitism part of it, which I found very interesting. At the same time, it makes me wonder, it makes me want to rethink the whole category of what an intellectual is for a working class movement. And I know that you obviously are in the center of that question with sublation, because in reality, that's what you're trying to do in a general sense. 
Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, right, I'm right. trying to bring. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I have a BA in philosophy from a state school in Oregon. Right. I'm not. I didn't go to a, a, an Ivy League school. I've written a few science fiction novels. Like I'm not a pedigreed intellectual. Right. I'm. I've done working class jobs. I don't think that it's um, uh, the case that only true elites can grasp reasoned arguments and be yeah. intellectual yeah. understanding and develop an imagination for transcendence. I think that that, in fact, will have to be part of any revolutionary exactly. struggle. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But what, I, what I'm trying to draw attention to is does that view you just articulated match the theory of Lenin and Lukács? And in a way, it kind of doesn't. Is what I'm trying to say. I think mm -hmm. that that maybe um, it does have a kind of commitment to a type of elitism in, in, implicit in it. Lenin does because of the vanguardism. In yeah, the, yeah. In well, no, no, no. But Lukács had that as well, right? And okay. and right. Mm -hmm. Lukács was a Leninist. Um, I mean, yeah. Who wasn't a Leninist? In so, I mean, Kutron shows how Adorno was, which was sure has got him yeah. into a lot of trouble making that argument. <laughs> right. It has. <laughs> right. But he I think that's a good thing about Adorno, right? The Adorno's lineage is redemptive. Yeah. But okay, so uh, uh I, the question of whether or not so this goes back to my earlier rejection of the of over concern with egalitarianism because okay, I think the work working people, everyday people can develop intellectually and can be public intellectuals and can help uh with an imaginative and yet rigorous way can engage and theorizing their own liberation. Exactly. But I think that it's probably going to be done through action as well, not just mm -hmm. from a space of, of pure contemplation or even a space of podcasting or something like that. You know, <laughs> but but um that's I also true, think that's that, true, but you need that's true. I also think that like the differences that exist of people who've had the time to read these things and think things through and uh, articulate them might develop into a kind of natural group of leaders or influencers to yeah, put yeah, it in, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know modern exactly, lingo exactly. and and that that doesn't make the that doesn't justify the class system that has no relation to the class system because the class system is not primarily about whose ideas are listened to it's about how things are produced mm -hmm. and who gets access to the wealth of society and how that and how things are distributed um, the well, it's the that, influence, it's political it's... influence, is tied to that, and when mm -hmm. and so we think that when we justify just having political influence or power, we're justifying what is. But mm -hmm. I think that we may live in a society after socialism where, yeah, some people are more influential than others. Mm -hmm. um, but that, but no one will be more free than others. The competition I mean, will yeah. continue. Well, I mean, look, look at like you know, we're seeing an interesting wave of what I call ultra liberalism, which mm -hmm. is a category that I learned from the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler in his mm -hmm. critique of Deleuze and Guattari. Mm -hmm. And Stiegler says something very interesting. He says, look, in about 1993, 94, Gilles Deleuze, you know, who wrote Anti-Oedipus, is very mm -hmm. famous. Oh yeah, let's get to this stuff. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> he, he, he says, uh, Stiegler says, look, Deleuze uh, uh, realized that all the concepts that he and Guatri had developed were kind of immunized by liberalism. This is made me, it made me think of like, okay, like what's a theory? Immunized that, against what? By liberalism. From, from their potency, from, from the from precise, themselves, from, 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 from the kind of core deterritorializing or kind of accelerationist overcoming of these kind of uh, contradictions that they assumed that the, repertoire of the concepts might be able to contribute to. Uh, mm -hmm. In other words, they got, you could think about this if you used a reference to um, hypernormalization by Adam Curtis. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing, which I think he does a nice job of describing, you know, which is sort of how do you describe the catastrophic betrayal of the new left at the moment where neoliberalism became inevitable for them? where they all had to become entrepreneurs and make a bunch of money and so on and so on and so on. Mm. Where all of that kind of petty bourgeois leisure time was no longer available to anybody, right? Mm. How do you account for that? Um, and, and Stiegler shows that it was an ideological question as well for Deleuze, which mm. was tied into something about liberalism itself and 
that propelled Deleuze to write his famous book on the control societies, which mm -hmm. became so influential for so many people. But what, what I liked about it was a kind of um, uh, logic whereby why is it that sometimes the most maximalist demands, if we take uh, 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 abolish the police, abolish the family, and so mm -hmm. on, paradoxically have a tendency for the kind of liberal ideology to just suck it up and roll with it. And the same notion of like Christian Smalls visiting Biden or what happened to the squad. I'm, we're in this weird space where leftist ideas can have co op can become co-opted at lightning speed, right? Okay, so I want to answer your question, if, even though it was somewhat rhetorical, about abolish the police, um, uh, or you know, uh, other demands. Ma but you know, maximalist, abolish the family. Maximalist. Yeah, maximalist demands. They're actually not maximalist. That's the, what. That's the first thing. The abolishing. What do you the mean police, by that? Um, because they aren't aimed at the root. They're not radical in the sense that they haven't worked out what the root of the contradiction in society is, but are tr looking at the appearance of, of conflict. So like with the police, why did the police, why are the police necessary to begin with? It's because they, they, you need a, 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 a Bonapartist state in, interference within the relationship between property, hmm. you know, uh, because we haven't achieved communism. Um, so the state has to come in and intervene and, and, and with, with the threat of violence and then also legal authority backing it to negotiate and mediate relations between uh, property owners and capitalists okay. and workers too. Okay. Because so that's why the police exist. And if you want to abolish them, you can't abolish just the police. You can't just defund the police because well, defunding the police will just lead to privatization of police, just mm. include, increase in neoliberal project. It's not like you're going to mm. get rid of the, the forces of violence that protect the property classes. Mm -hmm. That's not you're not going to get rid of it by just taking away public funding of it. And uh, and the aim to abolish the police. That you know, uh, that's just a no non-starter. Um, that you know, you're not going to just get rid of the police. The, the first people who are going to rebel against you in that case are the people in the most crime-ridden areas, the people mm -hmm. you're supposedly representing. Mm -hmm. um, so those demands are not radical demands. They may seem maximalist. The same thing I... with abolish the family. Mm -hmm. The you know, abolishing the family. Okay, why is the family structured the way that it is? Well, it's because we're kind of alienated from society in, in its totality. We so we have these little private reserves of intimacy and human connection that are called the family which are mm -hmm. under tremendous pressure mm -hmm. and are breaking down under that pressure and also you know yeah. so so you say abolish you the family yeah. you're telling people live without intimacy let me let me, completely ask, you, let me ask you a question mm -hmm. I, okay i generally agree with your presentation let me ask mm -hmm. you a question mm -hmm. how do you account for the sizable number of people particularly young people, et cetera, who are drawn to maximalist demands. Now, without, and I'm not s assuming you're going to say this, but without saying, well, you know, they're not as educated in socialist. Maybe no, that's not it at all. Okay, my yeah, own so, kids, so, like my own kids yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, will organize around these slogans. Exactly. You know, exactly. Why? It's the same reason all of the Marxists supported Bernie Sanders. It's is because, it? Is it? Is yeah, it? it is. It is. It's because they... I mean, they they're young, so they're more hopeful than us who organized around Bernie Sanders, right? Um, but it's basically okay. We cannot organize to to tackle the difficult problem of the class relationship. We don't mm -hmm. have a way to act to get at that problem. That that problem to really overcome it would take a revolutionary politics. But we can begin the process of going towards revolution mm -hmm. by taking up a demand um, that, uh, you know, it, it addresses a symptom and that people can see. And so, that, mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe through that organization that we've developed, we can get to a revolutionary politics. I mean, it's, it's sort of like uh, the 68 thing, demand the impossible, mm -hmm. you know, um, it, it basically express your dissatisfaction don't mm -hmm. accept the conditions of the current society 
Yeah. And but the but the even the the people organizing themselves, if you ask them, will say, yeah, obviously we can't just abolish the family. We can't just abolish the police. We have to get to the radical center of the problem. We will have to abolish ca uh, capitalism. And then actually, you know, uh, often enough, it's like, what is capitalism? Uh, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's not work fully worked out even amongst Marxists. There's still like, you know, debates. Well, one, but I mean, I OK, OK, that's all. I okay again. I I like what you're saying. Let's just roll with this for a second. So yeah. in my in my book on the family, I kind of mm -hmm. realized a few interesting dynamics. One is the petty bourgeois thing, which I already mentioned, of which we have a history of, which is that those demands, where do they come from? Well, they come also from a from a petty bourgeois e point of exemption from wage labor. So when we talk about class consciousness, I think it's interesting to remember that the experience of wage labor as a kind of constant form of exploitation that we experience in common in capitalism, which we can formulate a kind of platform um, like Debs, who will be the John Brown of wage slavery, right? Mm -hmm. um, that interests me, right? That sounds like a demand which is more rational than starting at a maximalist place. So I kind of agree with you on that. Um, but at the same time, I think it's interesting that the black radical tradition has actually pushed against socialist feminism historically on the abolition of the family. Why? In part because the attachments that proletarians have to the family is extremely passionate. Yes, it's ambivalent. Yes, it's um, probably those families are more prone to abuse, right? Yeah. More prone to bad things happening. But nonetheless, those attachments are much more uh, real. And so that's created an interesting debate within the, the radical left. But I think it's a debate worth having. Another thing I'll say mm -hmm. is in Mark Fisher's Acid Communism, his last piece of writing, he made a beautiful mm -hmm. reference to an American feminist that I think everybody should read um, called Ellen Wills. Mm -hmm. And she wrote about um, her experience on a commune during the New Left and how she had a divorce in her 20s. And then she kind of did the abolition of the family thing. And mm -hmm. she's very critical of it. But she said that what she's critical of kind of goes back to the hypernormalization thing that she's critical of the fact that they all sold out. They all were this, which had she, she basically took them at their word. Right. Let's do it. Let's live on a commune. Let's experiment with an alternative to bourgeois family and see what happens. Hmm? I mean, one of the things that's interesting is that in that experimentation, what, what are you trying to do? You're trying to promote a alternative mode of relationality, produce more joy, more pleasure. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. What's interesting to me about contemporary family abolitionists, and this might be a little critical towards them, is that they actually don't center joy. Mm -hmm. Fisher said we need to do the asset communism thing because neoliberalism makes us so fucking depressed. So, OK, if there's a family abolition commune radical leftist movement that wants to inculcate that kind of compassionate care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Sign me up. However, that's not really what's going on there, is it? Mm -hmm. That's not really. No, it's true. Well, you I, see my I, point? Yeah, so they've I lost, would say they've lost I, joy and pleasure. And yeah. I think I think should... we need to go beyond the pleasure principle. Because we I look, I just recently got divorced. All right. Uh, it's, it went through. I'm divorced. Um uh, it felt like uh, my family fell apart. My you know, one kid's still at home. Um, it was very hard. And what I lost was not pleasure. Mm. Um, like mm. I, I lost something different than that. I lost a sense of security in my identity mm -hmm. and I lost a uh, kind of meaning and a feeling of being in a, in a place of having a, life that made sense um so a kind of community i lost a com sense of security i lost a kind of community i lost a kind of meaning the pleasure part you know i actually i got on these apps i went out i had a good time the pleasure was there i had i laughed you know i got drunk that mm -hmm. no those things that but the the deeper problem of a loss of meaning and the loss of community and the loss of security and the sense that I knew where, who I was, that's what I lost. And I think that's what we have to remember when it comes to what the family's role is. The family mm. doesn't just provide us with 
joy and pleasure. Even it provides us with a way to cope with pain. That's right. It provides us with security. Right. It provides us to deal with the ambivalence of our lives. And, you know, when people feel their their family is threatened, it, it feels like an existential crisis. Mm-hmm. For people. Mm-hmm. So to say mm-hmm. abolish the family um, for most people uh you know i think is uh, going to be a, a non starter again and but the you know the you know who will like that is the people who have a kind of security in the society as it is correct that's um, why that goes back to the petty bourgeois thing right, and right right yeah yeah never. they'll yeah. like that that slogan abolish the family and they'll also know it doesn't apply to them because they can they're the ones who have probably have the most secure families but we around. should we should be with this this kind of goes to the Coutron piece because it's a yeah. question of not alienating them because in reality i would prefer to take a tactic that might throw a kind of point of dialogue with them a kind of Mm -hmm. exchange with them and you know lash christopher lash had a lot of really robust exchanges with radical socialist feminists and if you read them the transcripts Mm -hmm. they were quite respectful actually because lash was the kind of guy who would show like really subversive facts about how even radical puritan family structures had subversive feminist edges to them right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um he could bring that those details out and it kind of put them in their not their place but it kind of like (laughs) yeah yeah don't want to say that one but yeah yeah yeah, 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 it put those women in their place no 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 no, no. uh, right i don't mean it like that at all i know you know i know what i I mean to say is that we need that kind of mark fisher um dialogue between these two forms he calls the the leninist superego which is an interesting category for him he's the leninist superego says on the left we don't need to talk about these sunk features and institutions of everyday life we don't need to talk about revolutionizing them now that can kind of be deferred like so therefore it's a bit petty bourgeois foolishness to experiment in the revolution of everyday life uh, and Fisher basically goes back and he does a very poor job. I think of, uh, in, in, of saying, you know, that quote from Lenin where Lenin says in revolutionary times, uh, I don't want militants to listen to a symphony orchestra, uh, going back to the critique of pleasure. Mm-hmm. And Frederick Jameson has a great essay on this too, which is Lenin's asceticism, the necessary asceticism. And Fisher says, the left needs a healthy dose of Leninist asceticism, but it needs to be able to dialogue with the revolution of everyday life people, right? Mm-hmm. And that goes to the Crutron critique. Because yeah, okay, critique. Let, I'll tell you what. Why don't we break yeah. right here? I'm we're going to continue actually on the stream, no problem. But for people who are watching this later on YouTube, if you want us to hear the juicy gossipy part about how Crutron attacked Daniel and Daniel <laughs> attacked attacked Crutron. <laughs> And and uh, you know the what the, who are the platypus affiliated society and how <laughs> bad is everybody? Go to the patron. That's what you pay the five bucks a month for. Go to the patron, get the gossip. But actually, if you're watching on Twitch right now, you're going to get it right now. 